Shipwreck in the Sky by Iando Binder, the flight into space that made pilot Captain Dan Barstow famous. The flight was listed at GHQ as Project Songbird. It was sponsored by the Space Medicine Labs of the U.S. Air Force, and its pilot was Captain Dan Barstow. A hand-picked man, Dan Barstow, chosen from the Air Force's most important project of the year because he and his VX-3 had already broken all previous records set by hordes of V-2s, Navy Aerobees, and anything else that flew the skyways. Dan Barstow, first man to cross the sea of air and sight open unlimited space. Pioneer flight to infinity. He grinned and hummed to himself as he settled down for the long jaunt. Too busy to be either thrilled or scared, he considered the 37 instruments he'd have to read, the twice that many records to keep, and the miles of camera film to run. He had been hand-picked and thoroughly conditioned to take it all without more than a 10% increase in his pulse rate. So he worked as matter-of-factly as if he were down in the G's centrifuge of the space medicine labs where he had been schooled for this trip for months. He kept up a running fire of oral reports through his helmet radio down to Rough Rock and his CO. All roger, sir. Temperature falling fast, but this rubberoid spacesuit keeps me cozy. No chills. Doc Blaine will be happy to hear that. Weightless sensations? Pretty queer. And I feel upside down as much as right side up, but no bad effect. Taking shots of the sun's corona now with color film. Huh? Oh, yes, sir. It's beautiful, all right, now that you mention it. But hell, sir, who's got time for aesthetics now? Whoops. That was a close one. Tenth meteor whizzing past. Makes me think of flack back on those Berlin bombing runs. Din couldn't help wincing when the meteors peppered down past the flack of space. Below, he could see the meteors flare up brightly as they hit the atmosphere. Most of those near his position were small, none bigger than a baseball and Dan took comfort in the fact that his rocket was too small in the immensity around him. A direct hit would be sheer bad luck, but the good old law of averages was on his side. Yes, Colonel, this tin can I'm riding is holding together okay, Dan continued to rough rock. If he paused even a second in his reports, a top sergeant yell from the colonel's throat came back for him to keep talking. Every bit of information he could transmit to them was a vital revelation in this U.S. Air Force Alpha exploration of open space beyond Earth's air cushion with ceiling unlimited to infinity. Cosmic rays, sir? Sure, the reading shot up double on the Geiger. Huh? Nah, I don't feel a thing. Like Doc Baird suspected, we invented a lot of old wives' tale in advance before going into space. I feel fine. So you can put down cosmic ray intensity as a boogeyman. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, sir. The stars shine without winking up here. What else? Space is inky black. No deep purples or queer more than blacks like some jetted-up writers dream up. Just plain old ordinary dead black. Earth, sir? Well, it does look dish-shaped from up here. Concave. Sure, I can see all the way to Europe and... Say, here's something unexpected. I can see that hurricane off the coast of Florida. You said it, sir. Once we install permanent space stations up here... It'll be easy to spot typhoons, volcano eruptions, tidal waves, earthquakes, what have you, the moment they start. If you ask me with a good telescope, you could even spot forest fires the minute they broke out. Not to mention a sneak bombing on a target city. Oh, sorry, sir, I, I forgot. Dan broke off and almost retched as his stomach turned to flip-flop to end all flip-flops. The VX-3 had reached its peak of its trajectory at over 1,000 miles altitude and now turned down lazily at first. He gulped oxygen from the emergency tube at his lips and it felt better. Turning back on schedule, Rough Rock, peak altitude, 1,037 miles. Everything's fine, no danger. This was all a cinch. Hey, wait! Something not in the books just popped up. Stand by! Dan had felt the rocket swing a bit, strangely, as if gripped by a strong force. Instead of falling directly down toward Earth with a slight pitch, it slanted sideways and spun on its long axis, and then Dan saw what it was. Beneath, intercepting his trajectory, coming around faster over the curvature of the Earth, was a tiny black worldlet, 998 miles above Earth. It might be an enormous meteor, but Dan felt he was right the first time, for it wasn't falling like a meteor, but swinging parallel to Earth's surface on an even keel. He stared at the unexpected discovery as amazed as if it were a fire-breathing dragon out of a legend. For it was actually, he realized in swift, stunned comprehension, more amazing than any legend. Dan kept his voice calm. Hello, Rough Rock. Listen, nobody expected this. 
Hold your hat, sir, and sit down. I've discovered a second moon of Earth. Uh Uh-huh, you heard me right. A second moon. Tie that, will you? Sure, it's tiny. Less than a mile in diameter, I'd say. Dead black in color. Guess that's why the telescopes never spotted it. Tiny and black. Blends into the black backdrop of space. It has terrific speed. And that little Maverick's gravitational field caught my rocket. Of course, it can't yank me away from Earth gravity. But the trouble is... Yike! My rocket and the moonlit may be in for a mutual collision course. Dan's trained eye suddenly saw that grim possibility. Barreling around Earth in a narrow orbit with a speed of something near or over 12,000 miles an hour, the tiny new moon had, since its ascent, charged directly into his downward freefall. It was a chance in a thousand for a direct hit, except for one added factor. The moonlet exerted enough gravity pull out of its many million ton bulk to warp the rocket into its path and the thousand-to-one odds were thus wiped out, becoming even money. Nip and tuck, reported Dan, answering the excited pleadings and questions from Rough Rock. It won't be a head-on crash. I may even miss it entirely. Oh, Lord, not with that spire of rock sticking up from it. I'm going to hit that. Dan had heard an atomic bomb blast once, and it sounded like a string of them set off at once as the rocket smashed into the rocky prominence. The rock splintered. The rocket splintered. But Dan was not there to be splinted likewise. He had jammed down a button at the critical moment, and the rocket's emergency escape hatch had ejected him a split second before the violent impact. But Dan blacked out, receiving some of the concussion of the exploding rocket. When his eyes snapped open, he was floating like a feather in open, airless space. His rubberoid spacesuit, living up to its rigid chest, had inflated to its elastic limit. But it held, and within its automatic units began feeding him oxygen, heat, and radio power. He had a chance now because he had been ejected cleanly from the rocket without damage to his protective suit. The stars whizzed dizzily around him. Dan finally saw the reason why. He was not just floating as a free agent in space. He was circling the black moonlit at perhaps a thousand yards from its pitted surface. Hello, Rough Rock, he called. Still alive and kicking, sir. Only now, of all crazy mad things, I'm a moon of this moon. The collision must have knocked me clear out of my down-to-earth orbit. I must have been ejected at the same direction as the moonlit's course, in its gravity field. I don't, I don't know. Let the electronic brain figure it out sometime. Anyway, now I'm being dragged along in the orbit of the moonlit. How about that? Yes, sir, I'm circling down closer and closer to the moonlit. No, don't worry, sir. It has a weak gravity pull, only a fraction of it the Earth. So I'm drifting down as gently as a cloud. Stand by for my landing on Earth's second moon. The bloated figure in the bulging spacesuit circled the black, stony surface several more times in a narrowing spiral and finally landed with a soft, skidding bump that didn't even jar Dan's teeth. He bounced several times from a diminishing height of 50-odd feet in a grotesque slow motion before he finally came to a stop. He sat still for a moment, adjusting to the fantastic fact of being shipwrecked on an uncharted moonlet, crowding down his pulse rate, which might be over 10% normal now. Okay, Rough Rock, I hear you. You telling me, sir? Obviously, I'm marooned here. No rocket to leave with? No way to get back to terra firma? What? Well, if you'll pardon my saying so, sir, that's a silly question. Of course I'm scared. Scared green. Sorry about the rocket, sir, losing it for you. Me, sir? Oh, thank you, sir. But stop apologizing, will you? I know you haven't got any duplicates of the VX-3 ready. No rescue rocket. Dan listened a moment longer, then broke in roughly. Oh, for Pete's sake, will you stop crying over me, sir? So I get mine here. I might have gotten it over Berlin, too. Forget it, sir. Dan grinned suddenly. Look, what have I got to kick about? I'll go out on a flash of glory. At least one headline will put it that way. And I'll get credit in the history books as the man who discovered that Earth has two moons. What more could I ask, really? Dan blushed at the reply from Rough Rock. Will you lay off, please, Colonel? How else should a man take it? I'm still scared silly inside. But look, I've really got something to report now. This little runt moon makes tracks around Earth in probably two hours minus. If I remember my space nautics right, I'm already looking down over the Grand Canyon heading west. I'm going to get a pretty terrific bird's eye view of the whole world in two more hours, which is just about how much oxygen I've got left. Lucky, eh? Dan looked down, watching in fascination the majestic wheeling of the Earth below him. His little moonlet did not rotate, or rather, it rotated once for each revolution around Earth, as the moon did, keeping one face earthward, 
giving him an uninterrupted view. The Sierras on Earth hove into clear view and the broad Pacific. There would follow Hawaii, then Japan, Asia, Europe. No, he saw he was slanting southwest. It would be across the equator, past Australia, perhaps near the South Pole, then around up to the, the top of the world, past Greenland, following that great circle around the globe. In any case, his was the speediest trip around the world ever made by man. Before we're out of mutual range, Rough Rock, I'm going to explore this new moon. Me and Columbus. Stand by for reports. Dan did his walking in huge leap that propelled him 50 feet at a step with a slight effort due to the extremely feeble gravity of the tiny body. What did he weigh here? Probably no more than an ounce or two. Nothing much to report, Colonel. It's a dead, airless, pipsqueak planetoid. Just a big, mile-thick rock, probably. No life, no vegetation, no people, no nothing. Guess you might call me the man in the second moon. <laughs> the joke's on me. Well, one and three-quarters hours of oxygen left by the gauge, or uh, 105 minutes. Sounds like more that way. Uh, what's that, sir? Your voice is getting faint. Any last request from me? Well, one favor, maybe. Pick up my body some day with another rocket. Yeah, it'll stay preserved up here in this deep freeze of space. Thanks, sir. Can't hear you much now, going out of range. Give Betty my fondest, you know, the blonde. Well, sir, goodbye now. Dan was glad that Rough Rock's radio voice faded to a whispery nothingness. It wasn't easy to stay casual now. There was nothing more to say, really, and he didn't want to hear any more crying from the CO. The old man had sounded almost hysterical. He wanted just to be alone with his thoughts now, making his final peace with the universe. He checked the gauge with his watch, 90 minutes of oxygen to zero. Or, he thought with a grin, eternity minus 90 minutes. He was beginning to have trouble breathing, but it was awesomely grand watching the sweep of earth beneath him, the procession of dots that were islands strung across the Pacific South Seas like a necklace of green beads. He was still within radio range of ships below at sea, yet he didn't contact them. He had nothing to stay, like a ghost in the sky. Idly, he kept pitching loose stones, watching their rifle-like speed away from him. Again, a phenomenon of the weak gravity of the moonlit. Actually, he was able to pick up a boulder ten feet across and heave it away with ease. We who are about to die amuse ourselves, he thought. Then, because a thread of sudden hope still clung in a corner of his mind, he got an idea. It had lurked just beyond his mental grasp for some time now. Something significant. Abruptly, face alight, Dan switched on his radio and contacted a ship below, asking them to relay him to Rough Rock with the most powerful transmitter. Ahoy, Rough Rock! Stop adding up my insurance, Colonel. I'm coming back. No, sir. I haven't got out of my head, sir. It's so simple it's a laugh, sir. See you in a few hours, sir. And he did. Dan grinned when they hauled his dripping form from the sea. Aboard the search plane, they cut him out of the spacesuit to which he was still attached, his emergency twin parachute. But his helmet was gone, ripped loose, for Dan had been breathing fresh earth air during long parachute descent. They stared at him as a man dead come alive. Impossible to escape, he chuckled, repeating their babble. That's what I thought, too, until I remembered those data tables on gravity and escape velocity and such. How, on the moon... The escape velocity is much less than on Earth. And on that tiny second moon? Well, my clue was when I threw a stone into the air and it never came back. Dan gulped hot coffee. I got off the moonlit myself, then got up to more than a mile above it where I was free of its feeble gravity. But I was still in the same orbit circling Earth. I'd have continued revolving as a human satellite forever, of course, but for this emergency gadget hooked to my belt. Dan held up a metal gun with its empty tank and needle nose half burned away. Reaction pistol. Fires hydrazine and oxidizer. Ordinary jet rocket principle. Aiming it towards the stars opposite Earth, its reactive blast shoved me earthwards thanks to Newton. I needed a speed of about one half a mile a second. The powerful little jet gun had only my small mass to shove into free space. Without gravity or friction, that broke me from free fall around Earth to gravity fall toward Earth. Then I spiraled down under gravity pull. I reached lung-filling air density just in time before my oxygen gave out. One more danger was that I was beginning to heat up like a meteor due to the air friction. I flung out a prayer first, followed by my twin parachutes, designed for extreme initial shock. They held. 
slowed me to a paratrooper's drift the rest of the way down. Wait, a puzzled pilot objected. Your story doesn't hang together. How did you get off that moonlet? How did you get up there a mile above it, away from its gravity? There was nobody to throw you like a stone. I threw myself, said Dan. First I ran as fast as I could, maybe halfway around the moonlet to get a good running start, and then... Dan Barstow's grin then was undoubtedly the biggest grin in history. Well then, since the feeble gravity couldn't pull me back again, what I really did was to jump clear off that moon. End of Shipwreck in the Sky by Endo Bender